ವಕ್ರತುಂಡ ಮಹಾಕಾಯ ಸೂರ್ಯಕೋಟಿ ಸಮಪ್ರಭ ನಿರ್ವಿಘ್ನ ಕುರು ಮೇ ದೇವಾಕಾರ್ಯು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯಂ ವರದೆ ಕಾಮೂಪಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಂಭಂ ಕರಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸಿದ್ಧಿರ್ಭವತು ಮೇ ಸದಾ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಹರಿಯೋಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಕ್ಲೀವ್ಲೆಂಡ್ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ನೋ ಹೌ ಟು ಲವ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಲವ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಲಾ ಆಫ್ ದ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ನೋ ಹೌ ಟು ಲವ್ we will be loved by others this is a law of the universe swami chinmayananda the opposite of love is not hate we see that a lot with social media right now we see that a lot in the news that the opposite of love is hate but that's not true the opposite of love is fear in love there is oneness in fear there is twoness or separation only if there's fear can it devolve into hate but if there's no fear then naturally hate also cannot be there right now there's a lot of fear and hate also that's manifesting in our society and we need to fight against this and this fight doesn't have to be in the ordinary way that we think of in regards to violence this fight has to begin with yourself this is why i shared this quote if you learn how to love yourself you will learn how to love others and love is the most powerful force to change others i'm not sharing that we should have an agenda to change others but if if that's what's needed it will start by loving it will happen by loving such people and you will only be able to love them if you learn to love yourself this is what we're doing through our course this is quote called swa adhyaya swadhyaya swadhyaya is generally taken as self study but swa is that oneness swa is love adhyaya is to focus on this to understand and appreciate this if you're afraid if you're frustrated with the fear and hate that is manifesting make yourself strong enough to be part of the fight if you're not strong enough to be part of the fight then you give your the enemy more strength then what we're doing is visionary and as we complete chapter 2 of shrimad bhagavad gita i will highlight this some more prince arjuna has sat down in his chariot he's put his bow down and told bhagwan krishna not only will i not fight i will not speak and then some shlokas later <laughs> he becomes very talkative and he asks bhagwan krishna a series of questions 
But essentially his question is, how does a wise person think? Incidentally, he talks about how do they speak and sit and walk, but really he wants to know, how do they think? And I'm going to tell you in very clear terms how a wise person thinks. During winter times, they have like a 10-point furnace checkup. Or they have a 10-point safety check for your car. I'm going to give you 10 points to assess whether you are wise. Okay? See the love. I'm giving you that that opportunity to assess that you too can be wise. Here are those 10 points. This is my culling of the end portion of chapter 2 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. These qualities come in order, okay? In order of what Bhagavan Krishna shares. Number one, a wise person is content that I elaborate on a lot last week. Number two, a wise person is balanced. A wise person is balanced. Number three, independent. Number four, fearless. Number five, accepting. So the first five are content, balanced, independent, fearless, and accepting. Now, even before I get to the ne <coughs> next five, just think of what a fighter, what a leader, someone who has these first five qualities, how they would be, what a contributor they would be. Next five, they're disciplined. I know, scary, isn't it? <laughs> Number seven, they're devoted. That's a nice quality. Number eight, they are aware. Aware. Number nine, knowledgeable. They're knowledgeable. And number 10, once someone had asked Swami Tejo Mayananda, what is the defining characteristic of a religious minded person? And what did he say? They are happy is good, content I got. Think, I haven't mentioned it thus far. Peaceful, sort of like content. Humble, good. Someone wrote humble. If, there's, if they're knowledgeable, naturally they will also be humble. Vidya dadati, vinaya. So the last five were disciplined, devoted, aware, knowledgeable, and humble. These are the <coughs> indicators of one who loves others. The more that I think of Sanatana Dharma, I realize that this is a religion that is a flow of love. It has to be. Sanatana Dharma's foundation is Advaita. <coughs> If you think of the people who have reformed society the most in our context, it's people like Acharya Shankara. He has all of these qualities. Bujaswami Vivekananda. Bujaswami Chinmayananda. And we are also trying to make these qualities ours. How many of you love your family? By a show of hands, how many of you love your family? This is just tactics for me to keep you sort of awake. <laughs> they just finished 90 minutes of satsang and they're back for 90, 60 more minutes. <laughs> now, if you love your family, Swami Chinmayananda says, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You cannot love without giving. Agreed? What can you give your family in the deepest way? Think. You want to express your love to your family. What can you give them? Peace. Peace. Yourself. Yourself. Vedantic students are so boring. They always get the right answer right, <laughs> <laughs> right away. <laughs> I think at a technical level, the best gift you can give is one that they cannot gift themselves. Now, what can you give your family? Vasana 
kshaya. Vasana kshaya means a reduction or elimination of vasanas. The more your vasanas are dissolved, the more you become a catalyst for their vasanas to be dissolved also. And if you want to take this to the supreme, your enlightenment is a catalyst to their enlightenment. And I don't even mean at a physical level, I mean at a metaphysical level. So if you want to love your spouse, your parents, your children, get enlightened. <laughs> it's just that simple. <laughs> Those who are engaged in Vasana Kshaya, they're not just living for the individuality, nor family, nor society, nor community, or sorry, community society. Who are they living for? Humanity, because their only focus is divinity. Individuality, family, community, society, humanity, they're focused on them. And it's because they're tuned into divinity. We continue on to section 2.17 and 2.18. How many of you follow feng shui? How many of you follow feng shui? Okay, feng shui is in our terms, is Vastu Shastra. In Feng Shui, you have to balance or harmonize Qi. Yes? You have, to, you have to make this flow. Now, if you think of the word Qi, I feel the word Qi comes from Chit. It comes from Chit. And what does Chit mean? Consciousness. Though it's spelt feng shui, it's pronounced feng shui. Because I see a lot of people judging me right now. So now I'm judging you back <laughs> for your judgment. <laughs> it is the flow of, of chit. And part of this feng shui is you put a black tortoise facing the north of your home, of your institution. Now this black tortoise, this tor tortoise, also pronounced as tortoise, <laughs> comes out strongly in the end portion of chapter 2 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. And in this, Bhagavan Krishna says that a wise person is like a tortoise, that when the tortoise is afraid, that tortoise brings in its limbs, its head and its arms and legs. And that's why you see in many of our mandars, they'll have a tortoise outside the mandar. Now, for those who have come to Sandipani with me, before you come to Sandipani, there's a tortoise on which is the universe. The idea being is before you go to this mandar, make sure that your senses and the boss of your senses, that is the mind, they are not going into the world. Jita Indriya hat. We just studied that, no? Jitta Asangaha, we just studied that from Srimad Bhagavatam. Not just in mandirs, this should be in your homes also. Outside your homes or right in the beginning entrance of your home, you should have this tortoise. Now what you need to know about this is that a tortoise brings in its limbs out of fear. A master brings in his or her limbs and mind, not out of fear, but out of contentment. Those are very different. Out of fear versus out of contentment. When you and I disengage the body, the breath, the mind, out of fear, that's called suppression. That though you're not doing it, you still want to do it. It's suppression. And you and I, we are experts in this. And I really enjoyed the reading of this section where Swami Tejumayananda says, we almost want to forget the reason um, to be disciplined with our senses. We actually want to forget that because we don't have a real reason to be disciplined. So if we forget it, then we can go back to being indisciplined. We can go back to being indulgent. 
I do this all the time with practicing being a vegan. Oh, I didn't know that there was milk in this ice cream. <laughs> I didn't know that there was ghee in this, in this rice. And it shows that it's not that much of a reality for me. And I don't mean that in a proud way, but I'm just saying in a, in a practical, experiential way. And we do this with so many things. We want to forget. And we want to forget because it's not real to us. Whereas a master who can bring in his limbs and mind out of contentment, it is because of their pragnya. Nya means to know or knowledge, and the prefix pra means before knowing. Before knowing, if you think about this, I can see this phone, I know this phone, but before my eyes is my mind, before my mind is my ego, before my ego is awareness. That's what pragnya means. Before the knowing, before the experiencing, you are in tune with that, and sthita means they're standing or they're immersed in that sink, that sink with awareness. For someone who has this sthita pragnya, someone who's immersed in being in tune with their nature, then they're not suppressing, but they're sublimating any experience. See, for them, this relative world has no reality, so there's no reason for them to indulge in all of this. So they sublimate all of this. For us, the absolute is not real for us, so we indulge in the relative. But for them, the relative is not, there's no reality to this, so they are immersed in the absolute. So sthita pragna begins with this knowledge of who you are. This knowledge of who you are is not different than loving who you are. When someone is not engaged in pragnya, they're not engaged in knowing who they are, the result of that is pramado ve mrityuhu. Pramadaha means inadvertence. Forgetfulness is death. It is death of their potential. And in the same portion of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Krishna shares the ladder of fall. And I'm going to share this with you. I think I shared this in the Moa Mudgara course recently. But that was on Thursday, and this is Tuesday. So how are we supposed to remember what happened on Thursday when today is Tuesday? So I'm going to share with you what this fall looks like. And... We already know it. I'm simply going to put structure to all of this. So here we are in a neutral sense. And the first step that we fall down is being distracted. Okay, imagine a ball coming down the stairs. What's the first step? That ball has gone from the top to one step down. It is being distracted. And they're all sections of D's and A's. They're alternating. Once you become distracted, what is the next step that you fall down? You become attached. Whatever you're distracted by, you start to get attached to that. Once you're attached to that, you become desirous. Now it's not just, I think that will make me happy. I know this will make me happy. And that knowing is very false. So you become desirous. What's the next A? Anger. See, that one everyone knows. Distracted, maybe not, attached, but anger. We become angry. And that's just half. <laughs> we get to anger, there's still half more to go. And just think of our condition when we're angry. Angry when driving. Angry when it snows when we don't want it to snow. Angry when someone is disobedient. That anger goes to the next fall, which is being deluded. And then there's more. After being deluded, we become amnesic. Amnesic is essentially you forget. You forget your past, you forget your future. 
After being amnesic, it's being devolved. If you were humans, what does being devolved mean? You become more like an inefficient animal. Animals are faster, they can bite harder. And the final A is being pranashati or annihilated. We have crushed ourselves. So looking at me, what was the first rung? Just think D's and A's in English. What's the D? Distracted, attached, desirous, anger, ang angry, yes. Deluded, amnesic, devolved, and annihilated. And how did it all start? Being distracted. Don't we say distracted driving kills? They co copied that from <laughs> Srimad Bhagavad Gita. I'll explain a little bit more about distraction. Adhi asa becomes adhyasa. Adhi asa. Adhi means nearby. Asa means to sit. When you sit nearby, the qualities of what you're sitting nearby, we start to superimpose those as our qualities. The example in our scriptures is if a crystal is in front of this gray cloth, what color does the crystal become? Gray. Does the crystal have gray color? No, but it's sitting near this sweater, so it becomes gray. If you're at a sports game, if you're at a celebrity event, and they're taking pictures of that celebrity, and you happen to be in that picture in the background, then don't you tweet that to other people saying, look, they're taking, <laughs> taking pictures of you. Adhyasa. <laughs> Sitting near. Now, if you think of it, why did you get distracted in the first place? Because we superimposed adhyasa, completion on what we're getting distracted by. If I feel that watching television will complete me, I get distracted by it, right? If I feel that um, getting a promotion will complete me, that's all I think about is that promotion. Then. See how it, being incomplete or lack of knowing who you are is most dangerous. And the opposite or the cure of adhyasa is upaasa or upasana. That's why we have such emphasis in our shastras is if we're getting distracted by articles, beings, and circumstances, go and sit at an altar. Sit with Guru. Sit with God. Upasana. When you sit with Guru, when you sit with God, then you don't get distracted. I know we still do, but we shouldn't <laughs> get distracted then. That's why Bhagavan and, and Guru, they're so attractive because of their happiness. That's what we want also. So the cure for adhyasa is upasana. And here we also realize as your sankalpa, so your sangha. As your sankalpa, so your um, sangha, whatever you think about or are distracted about, by, we tend to get attached to that. When we were learning this, Swami... <coughs> Tejomayananda shared during our understanding of the latter fall, you have to make two pacts with yourself if you're going down this ladder. Pact number one. You will not fall further. That's the first pact you have to make. So if you're on rung four, you fall into rung four, your pact is you will not fall to rung five. And that may seem very obvious, but it's not that obvious. Some people feel I'm already in a downward motion. Why? Stop. I've already eaten one extra chapati. Why not eat the second and third and fourth extra chapati? But pact one is you will not fall further. <clears throat> pact number two, from wherever you are, you will climb higher. So you've stopped the downward motion and now you have to initiate the 
upward motion. This whole section on 218, please study this well. Punaha, punaha, punaha. Keep studying 2.18 because if it's a ladder of fall, it's also a ladder of rise. Ladders go both ways, isn't it? Not just downwards. And remember I said pramado ve mrityuhu. Inadvertence is death itself. The more you fall down, the more avidya there is. And the more you go up, the more remembrance there is. When someone is deluded, their intellect, which is really their lighthouse, is confused. Imagine this, in, this lighthouse is spinning its light around, but it doesn't really know where the land is and where the rocks are and where the water is. Can you trust that intellect then, that lighthouse? It's confused. And if not checked there, when we go into amnesia, the intellect becomes closed. It doesn't know its value system. It doesn't know um, integrity. It's closed. It's like a security store that's closed. It doesn't help you then. It's still there, but it doesn't help you in that moment. But if you get to devolved, that intellect has collapsed. That it's not just temporarily not there. It's not there at all. Then we chant, buddhi that I have an intellect, but it's not available to me. It's collapsed. Imagine that security company goes bankrupt. So as that intellect goes away, more avidya. As that intellect comes back, more vidya. I really like 2.18. And in section 219, they, what Swami Tejramayananda gives is a whole series of how to slow down the fall or even prevent the fall. Okay? So you should study that. But what I've done is I've taken <laughs> these eight rungs that have come down and I've created, in my own mind, the opposite to prevent or stop or slow the fall. Okay? So if being distracted is this uh, symptom, what is the solution then? Focus. See, you're, you're taking it at an English level. You need to take it at a sadhana level. You're distracted because you're not interested in what you should be interested in. So how do we stop or slow distraction? Be interested in what your responsibilities are. Stop projecting that such and such and such will complete you. Be grateful for your car rather than looking at someone else's car. Be grateful that your body works instead of being distracted by someone else's appearance. Be interested. If we get to rung two, which is being attached, if that's the symptom, what is the solution? Be analytical. We get attached because we superimpose completion. But if you're analytical, you know no article, no being, no circumstance can complete you. If articles can, could complete you, the more you have of it, the more complete you should be. But that doesn't make sense. Be analytical and see how you stop at attachment. But if you get to being desirous, if that's the symptom, what is the solution? Being generous is good. You can all write to if you wish. Be content. Be content. <coughs> A desirous person ignores what they have and expects what they don't have. A content person expects what they have. So they're very grateful for what they have and they ignore what they don't have. So if you're feeling very desirous to make sure you don't fall more, practice contentment. If you're at the anger step, step, if, I know it's rare, 
that you and I lose our, our patience. If we're at that angry step, what would be the solution to that? It's the solution. Love. Love, Love gratitude. Forgive. Forgive. Accept. Good. Be accepting. You see, the anger is someone who stopped that desire from happening, correct? But if you practice acceptance, Bhagavan didn't want you to have that desire, no? <coughs> when Raja Parikshita was told that he has one week to live, did he get angry? That this is my training. Accept. If you get to being <coughs> deluded, you know, I just don't know who I am. What should you do? What is the solution when that happens? But see, if you're deluded, it's very hard to study. Satsang. Be quiet. <laughs> Just don't say anything. <laughs> don't do anything. Don't say anything. Because whatever you do and say is only going to make it worse. And for the typical sociologist, that's the only tip they have. If you're angry, go for a walk. If you're angry, take a shower. If you're angry, you know, they so temporarily deal with it. But that doesn't go on forever. This solution is just be quiet. If you get to being amnesic, if you forget your past, if you forget your future, if you forget your Acharya Shankara says, your parents and your teachers, what do you do? What is the solution? Be associating. Be associating, mean, meaning be around people who can remember. Be around people who are not amnesic. Satsang. Because if I've forgotten my value system, if I start to see, hey, that person thinks that this value system is important, it helps for that to come back to me. Be associating. If you're at the devolved step, we're very animalistic right now. This mind is taking us everywhere. What is the solution? When you go for walks in neighborhoods, what scares you during your walks? I'm talking about before the election. What scared you during your walks? Dogs, no? You're all not scared of dogs. Okay, well, I'm scared of dogs. That's what scares me on my walks. <laughs> And if those dogs are barking at me, and if means they do bark at me, but if they're with their owner, what does that owner do then? Is forceful with that dog, correct? Holds that chain, brings them closer. If you're being, if you're at that stage of being devolved, be forceful. Be forceful with the mind. Force the mind to do japa. Because if you do japa, you raise, reduce, and redirect. You Hold that mala and you just keep trying again and again and again. Be forceful because if you're not forceful, that animal, which is the mind now, will bite you. And now the last. If we are annihilated, what do we do? What is the solution to being annihilated? Be enduring. There's nothing you can do but suffer. And as you suffer enough, you will wake up <coughs> and start to be forceful and start to be associating and start to be quiet and all, get all the way to the top then. But once we're annihilated, it's like, it's like being in prison prior to any sort of probation. You just have to be in prison. Coming back to being content, every one of us needs infinite joy, and every one of us is infinite joy. Remember, I emphasized that a lot last week, that we are what we need, that we need what we are, and I'd asked you to contemplate on that. Unless you start to believe that your nature is joy, 
then we will be forever distracted. Extrovert. An extrovert person is distracted. But someone who at least believes intellectually that their nature is joy, they will be less distracted. They will be more interested in being introvert. In some of the retreats that I facilitate, I ask people as part of their discussions to prove that their nature is joy. Just like you prove congruent triangles, side angle side, side side side. Can you prove that your nature is joy? And there's lots of reasons on how to prove that. But one that stands strong in, in my mind is we escape that which is unnatural. If there's bacteria in this body that is unnatural, this body will force that bacteria out. But if there's bacteria that's natural, this body won't force it out. It's part of the ecosystem. When you are distracted, attached, desirous, angry, deluded, amnesic, devolved, annihilated, do you like being there? Do you try to stay there? I'm annihilated. This is awesome. From this perspective, I can only go, go up. <laughs> no, we try to escape by working more, sleeping more, drinking more, eating more, talking more. We escape that. But when you're interested, analytical, content, accepting, quiet, do you try to escape that? You know, when you're so quiet inside and so quiet outside and someone comes and brings up a worldly matter, you just put your hand up like this. Not that you're going to slap them, but it may come to that, but just stop talking. You know, just let's enjoy this, this scene. You escape that which is unnatural. Your nature is not any of these rungs that are falling. Your nature is past this ladder. You are joy. Embrace that. Bhagavan Krishna brings up once again that if we have this ignorance of our nature, if we don't believe that we are infinite, we start to believe we are the ego. And a primary exp <coughs> expression of being egotistical is doership. Kartritva bhava. I'm the doer. And wherever there's doership, what comes with it? Deservership. The game goes on. And what comes with deservership? Desire. And what comes with desire? Dependency on what you just got to experience. Doership, deservership, desire, and dependency. Those are all very weak ways to live. We don't want to be more dependent, we want to be more independent. Not more desires, more content. Not more deserving, we want to be more acknowledging and not more doership oriented, but more humble. This ego, this ego is the um, enemy, this ego is the problem, this ego causes us to play a game that doesn't end. I get to interact with people who are part of many other organizations, many other institutions, and I see the work that they're doing, and I feel a lot of it is not related to the ego. If you think about our problem is avidya, then, then, and then really all we need is vidya, correct? We share vidya dhanam, maha dhanam. This Bhagavad Gita course and Chinmay Mission is focused on what we need, not what we want. We need vidya so that that ahankara can be there. See, many other organizations and institutions, they're not focused on Brahma Vidya, they're focused on Loka Vidya. They're giving knowledge on energy, how to have more energy, and how to, you know, 
have less stress with people. That's not what you need. After you do that, then you'll say, now what? So what, really? So many, and that's why those, those organizations and institutions and courses are about popularity. This is what we need, vidya. It requires steadiness and sincerity. And I'm, I was thinking a lot about this. There's an episode of The Simpsons where Lisa's um, practicing being a vegetarian. And so Homer and Bart, they start to tease her and they keep saying, you don't win friends with salad. You don't win friends with salad. And then Marge starts joining them too. And Lisa's like, why are you saying this? And she said, it's just so catchy. <laughs> I was thinking that, you know, some of the organizations that focus on loka vidya, you know, again, about energy and, and you know, de-stressing and everyone, you know, getting along together and all of those matters. That's like eating salad only. Can you be healthy just eating salad? Just salad. Can you be satisfied just eating salad? You'll eat it for some time, but then you'll say, now what? So here we have an opportunity to be part of a course, to be part of a, a, a guide that is Swami Chinmayananda that only focuses vidya. Be aware of this opportunity that is being shared. And that's what Bhagavan Krishna is telling Prince Arjuna, that, hey, Arjuna, you said you're not going to um, fight, you're not going to speak. Look what you can be. And he finishes chapter 2 with the Sthita Pragna Lakshanas. Oh.